So I want to talk tonight about patience. And as I was saying just kind of before we officially began, patience seems like such a modest virtue. It's like down to earth, patience, whatever. But I actually think that the qualities of patience broadly and warm heartedness are right at the center of enlightenment, as well as uh, you know movements in that direction, as well as just everyday functioning. Uh, when we think of people that uh, who seem to do, do you know do reasonably well in life and uh, you know make things better rather than worse around them, they're probably characterized by a fairly strong trait of patience combined with a fairly strong trait of lovingness. Warm, warm heartedness and the, and the two together. So patience is is real. It's important. Um, think first of examples in which you weren't patient. Like I can think of myself, talking about myself, uh, <clears throat> as people who know me well know, uh, if I'm trying to get something done and I'm moving in a direction, and um, you know, there are people just sort of in the way, you know, like you're trying to get the attention of a sales clerk and that there are other people yakking around with that person seemingly just because they're the long lost friends or you're, you're moving through an airport and there are people who are standing in a hallway, standing in a doorway, like you can't get through the doorway because they're talking with each other. Ugh, that kind of gets me. Uh, our daughter gave me an example a little earlier about people who get impatient with their dogs and they get rough with them, and you can see, or parents who are impatient with their children. By the way, I'm seeing some animals popping into the screen in some homes, which really makes me happy. <laughs> anyway, um, so you might know, what does it feel like to get impatient or related feelings of exasperation, frustration, drivenness, or you just can't stand something, or you want it to change quickly, or you just feel so restless. Ugh, like you want something different to be happening. These are all examples of movements away from the virtue of patience. On the other side of it, you might think about examples of real patience. So I wanna give you three. Uh, <clears throat> one example comes from a time I was in an airport, which is sort of a seat of a lot of impatience sometimes. And I watched someone in robes, a red robe seemed probably like a monk uh, from Southeast Asia, walking through the airport by himself and, uh, you know, just looking around. I think the flights were delayed. And I watched him in a very calm, self-contained sort of way, just sit in one of the seats there in the airport waiting room, look around a bit, gather his robes about himself and just close his eyes and probably just start meditating. And I thought, wow, there I was really restless, trying to jam three more emails uh, out the door before I got in the line to you know, get on the airplane, uh, trying, you know, frustrated that the flight was late, calculating how long it would take before I finally got home. And he, oof, it was what it was. So impatience, obviously, is clear seeing, recognizing things as they are, and in a fundamental sense, accepting them. This does not mean um, shilly-shallying around and goofing off and slowing things down unwisely for other people, nor does it mean being endlessly patient about bad conditions in society that, um, you know, and, and just being apathetic about them. Patience is not ap apathy. We can be patient while also doing everything we can to plant a fruit tree and take good care of it as the years go by while knowing that we have to wait for it to give us an apple. Right. So that's my first example. And you might think of examples yourself. A second one comes from our daughter. Uh, she was maybe three years old. Uh, there was the, she was in a nursery school and, you know, it was the annual spring festival. So my wife and I came into the audience with hundreds of other parents, you know, it was that one event each year. And all the kids do little performances of one kind. And Laurel, I knew, was going to do something with a kind of xylophone. They have sort of a junior xylophone uh, where they you know bang on it with a hammer and it makes a pretty song. And uh, Laurel came to the front and I'm of course 
you know, my heart's cavelling with joy and also nervous. Oh, what could go wrong? <laughs> and she sits down and uh, the musical instrument was placed before her. And as she sat in some way, something happened. I don't know what. And it fell over and all the pieces scattered because they're individual little pieces of wood of increasing sizes that make the different notes when you kind of whack them with the hammer. And we're like, oh, no. And you could just feel the tension in the audience whose epicenter was me, I'm sure. What's going on here? Uh, and Laurel just ignored all of it. She, This little three-year-old just reached out for each one of the pieces, gradually reassembled it. It probably took her 90 seconds, which felt like 90 hours to me. She just did it in her own pace. And then she picked up her hammer. I'm getting kind of heartfelt about it as I say it. And then played her beautiful song. And it was over. Everybody's clapping. She just looked around. Oh, yeah, whatever. <laughs> and walks off the stage. And I thought, what a teaching. Not being pushed by external pressure, right? Social pressure, social demands, you know, expectations of others. Like to speed up or jump to their timetable. And to be clear again, I'm not talking about unwisely or unkindly ignoring others and not respecting their time and appreciating their schedule. But so much of the time, other people want us to do things at a certain pace. And okay, but we didn't agree to that. That's their pace. It's not necessarily our pace. And um, you might want to think about situations in life where people want to hurry you along. I mean, I've had roommates where I, when I was younger, I would live with and the phone would ring. And um, this was before answer machines or back in the Stone Age, I, although answering machines did come along after a while. And this one roommate in particular could not stand to let the phone ring. And he would look at me and I, I was like, you know, there's actually nobody I want to talk to right now. <laughs> my mom, my dad, my ex-girlfriend. Nope, <laughs> none of them. I'm doing this right now. I can call them back later or something like that. So just think about the ways in which sometimes we get pressured by others. And in fact, the truth is we can retain a certain autonomy. So there's an element of patience that's also about an inner freedom in which we are aware of what is jostling us, but we don't let it invade us and control us. That's a second example. And then a third example is taken from the book Siddhartha by Herman Hesse, the classic. And um, there's a lot about that story, which is kind of a fictional account of the Buddhist life. And uh, in, in the book, kind of sort of tracking uh, a chapter in the Buddhist life that as best we know never happened, but it's an, interest, it's an interesting teaching. Uh, this young man, has done all these deep meditative ascetic practices, starved himself to death, but were nearly, but they didn't really do the trick for him. They they were good, they carried him a long way, but they weren't the ultimate. They weren't the ultimate for him. So he decides to kind of go back to normal life and, and learn from it. So he, he needs a job. So he approaches this grain merchant. And if you ever see the film Siddhartha, it's kind of amusing how this is portrayed. And the merchant sees that this, this young guy definitely has something going for him, but is trying to figure out what kind of job can I give you? So the merchant says, well, can you, can you lift big, heavy loads? Well, no, can't do that. Uh, do you know how to operate a boat? No, don't know how to do that. Can you, you know, drive an ox cart? No, don't know how to do that either. Uh, the merchant bursts out, well, what can you do? And Siddhartha pauses and says, well, I can think. I can fast. And I can wait. I can wait. Wow. One of the central virtues, thinking, fasting, and waiting uh, in this deeply trained young yogi. Wow, I can wait. So this is kind of an introduction to this territory of patience. And now I'd like to talk in more practical ways about how we can experience patience and how we can deepen it as actually a trait so that as you might have started to experience perhaps in the meditation, we can more and more rest in an underlying mood 
of patience rather than impatience. And you can also think about the ways in which our culture can train us into a mood of impatience. You know, hurry up, right? Let's let's get it done faster, speed it up. There you are, you know, you're trying to change to a new program on Netflix and it takes four seconds to load. Come on, Netflix, hurry up. <laughs> so patience. Well, first suggestion is mindfulness of impatience, including subtleties of exasperation or a sense of feeling pressured or kind of insistent or just this feeling of a kind of should aimed at other people or other situations. Like I should not be on hold this long or they should bring my food faster or you know where is that delivery person who was supposed to arrive? You know, just the, the feeling of it, right? So right there, mindfulness of it, especially as we get primed. You think of this two-stage process. We start becoming increasingly impatient or hurried for different reasons maybe. And that's the first stage that primes us. It readies us for when in the second stage, if there's a trigger, then we snap. We snap at the other person, we get irritated, we say something un unwise, kind of critical, we come out with it, you know, we lose our cool a little bit. So it's this two-stage process that sometimes happens, being aware of um, the priming, you know, the gradual subtle accumulation of a mood of impatience be mindful of that, because then especially it's important to try to slow it down, disengage, or at least really be on the lookout for getting triggered and snappish. Uh, a lot of my errors as a dad um, happened because I was impatient. You know, I wanted things to happen faster, and or, or I was kind of building up a sense of impatience, and then our son or something would just take too long to get his jacket so and get into the car and go to school right? So mindfulness of impatience. Second suggestion is to be aware <clears throat> of the beliefs that underlie or turbocharge impatience, such as think like internal rules that it ought to be faster or it ought to be like this. Expectations are a kind of belief about, um, you know, the way things ought to be. Um, <clears throat> there might be judgments about certain kinds of people as dawdlers or slackers. Uh, sometimes, frankly, some of these judgments can be situated in larger structures of social domination of one kind or another in which uh, more elite groups characterize, um, you know, groups that are oppressed as somehow lazy or indolent or unmotivated uh, and uh, or unaware of time. You, know, you just see that situated in culture. And particularly if you, like me, kind of belong more toward with, belong to generally speaking, more advantaged groups of people, be particularly aware of these kind of stereotypes or even prejudices that can help to drive uh, you know, impatience aimed at other people. Uh, there's a kind of criticality and irritableness in impatience often expressed at other people. Uh, even sometimes people who uh, you want them to catch up, you know, speed up, come to the party, understand it faster, see the light quicker. You're not enlightened yet. <laughs> so just be aware of those views and the righteousness that um, can you know, really be involved with them. You might think about someone in your life that you realize, you know, I wanna dial it back. I, I just, I've been impatient, I wanna correct there. You might do a bit of a review of your own views related to that person or the justifications you mobilize for your own impatience. Um, I should add before I go any further that sometimes we get impatient with others 
because we've not taken care of our own needs as well enough yet, right? We, we feel like we're kind of running on empty. And so, yeah, that, that tends to foster impatience toward others. And on the other hand, when a person is well-fed, uh, when they're not angry, when they're not lonely, and they're not tired, in other words, when they're not in the acronym, I think from Alcoholics Anonymous of HALT, they're not hungry, angry, lonely, or tired. Not that. Well, when we're in more of a green zone, it's a lot easier to be tolerant, accepting, easygoing, and patient with other people. So, you know, fostering your own well-being is, is really important here. Which then leads me into three kind of key sort of neurological, neuropsychological factors of patience, right? And um, the first of these is the ways in which, uh, understandably, grounded in evolution, uh, our brains are very quick to register anything that's unpleasant or potentially unpleasant and mobilize an aversive reaction to it. Uh, that process is you know, really centered a lot in the amygdala, the alarm bell of the brain. It can also track uh, positive things and that are, that are personally relevant. But for most people, it's pretty biased toward watching out for things that you know, are unpleasant. And we feel like we can't put up with them any longer. We don't, we don't want them to continue. And obviously, we should pull our hand away from the hot stove. We should pull the child back from the onrushing traffic. We should do what we can, deal with the bad. Sure, for sure. But a lot of conditions in life, they're unpleasant, uh, but they're not, and they're not going to change for a while. We just need to bear them. We either fight with them or we bear them. And there's a very interesting space, and this is one that the Buddha intensely encourage people to investigate mindfulness of the hedonic tones of experiences, the sense of them as unpleasant or pleasant or neutral. Or I would add emergingly, I think in, in us genuinely in our evolution, uh, the sense of things as relational. And so for example, I don't like it hot. I grew up in Los Angeles, a lot of heat there. It's not my nature. Uh, I wonder if it's kind of due to my Celtic genetic or you know, paths, probably half of me at least, that I tend to like it cool and Scottish and, you know, et cetera. But I don't like it hot. And I was um, uh, leading our meditation gathering in person a couple, some time ago when we were still meeting in person. And it was really hot. The room was hot. It wasn't air conditioned. It was the height of summer. And I noticed that it was really hot. It was unpleasant, but it did not bother me. I didn't like it but it did not bother me. And that distinction between not liking and call it hating is really important. It's possible to recognize that something is unpleasant. It's painful. It's uncomfortable. You know, you can't get food yet. You can't find a bathroom yet. You know, you can't talk to someone you need to talk to yet. You're standing in line. It's unpleasant. Your feet hurt. It's tiring. Your back's killing you. You got to use the bathroom, but you don't want to lose your place in line. There you are. But can we be there without being bothered by it in an invasive, disruptive sense? That's such a distinction. And one way to cultivate the shock absorber, a kind of inner shock absorber that supports our equanimity in which we can be untroubled amidst troubling conditions uh, is with regard to this aversion toward what's unpleasant is to deliberately tune in to the internal sensations of your body, particularly the ones that are soothing and comforting and reassuring, such as the going onness of breathing, the going on being of, of your heart. You're still here. You're okay. You're basically all right right now. It's not the greatest. You wish it were different. You wouldn't wish this on another person, so it's okay to not like it for yourself. But in the core of your being, you're still okay, still okay, still okay. And really turning up the volume on those genuine internal signals from the body that are moving up and into the brain 
that are telling you you're you're still okay. I'm seeing some of the comments coming in from the outside. Maybe the b dogs are barking next door. Maybe your feet are really hurting. It's it's not good. I got it. But in the core of my being, I'm basically okay. Continuing to refocus there and turning up the volume of that authentic internal signal is a really good way to become more patient with things that are unpleasant. Second, <clears throat> with regard to the brain's natural um, patterning to seek rewards. I think of it as a kind of foraging. It's like animals that are foraging. They're looking for something new to want. Even if they've got a banana in their hand, they're looking around for another banana. Uh, I'll see birds uh, or squirrels feeding in our backyard and they'll grab something, they'll get it. They'll quickly look around to make sure no one's gonna take it from them. And then they look for the next thing. That's a natural thing. And you can watch your own mind often uh, deliberately trying to generate something new to want, right? And it, then it'll create like this little mini fantasy, a little mini movie of, oh, I could do this. I could do that, which then lead us into a sense of discontent. Discontent is the opposite of patience, right? We're not content in the moment, in our core. Yeah, it would be nice to have more of this, uh, to accomplish more of that. But meanwhile, can we deliberately locate a genuine sense of contentment already? And one of the things that can help us do that neurologically is to widen our frame. Because when we're discontented, we're driven toward a particular object, a particular chunk of cheese that we want. We want the goody. Give me my precious, right? Give me the goody. And so that narrows our focus. And when we narrow our focus, that fosters all kinds of rumination in neural networks that do that with a strong sense of self, not patient. On the other hand, if we go out to the wider view deliberately, we get a sense of the room as a whole, the situation as a whole, the big picture, that tends to naturally move us into a sense of gratitude, even awe, even a sense of, in a healthy way, humility as important aspects of, of awe or a sense of the bigger picture. It's not that we're negated in the bigger picture, but that we're, we're you know, we're with what's so vast, we're with vastness, we're with allness, and our own drivennesses pale in comparison. They seem small amidst the abundance of the allness that we inhabit just by virtue of being alive here in this earth, taking this breath, seeing this sight, hearing the sound, tasting the taste, smelling the smell, thinking the thought, here we are, right? So that process, it's very simple, isn't it? You can start to experiment with it where you're preoccupied with wanting something, make yourself take a breath, maybe be aware of your body as a whole, then be aware of the room as a whole, then kind of even zoom out a little further, get a sense of things, you know, hundreds of miles around you, earth as a whole, the universe all together. Notice how you feel. Feel a lot more content and a lot less driven toward a particular goal. Very cool. When we do that things as a whole process, we tend to engage, engage the right hemisphere more uh, for right-handed people, it's switched for many left-handed people because it's holistic. And we reduce activity in the midline cortices that are much more involved in kind of stressful drivenness with a preoccupation with the future or the past and a preoccupation with ourselves. So contentment, contentment and spaciousness, vastness, even awe can help us be a lot more patient. Also, third, we get disturbed in uh, with regard to our connections with others, right? We, you know, we want more five-star reviews for our book on Amazon. More, <laughs> you know, we want more praise. 
We want more feedback that we're impressive. Uh, we say things to certain people and we want a certain kind of reaction. And then we get impatient if we don't get that reaction. And I'm not trying to justify being in, in relationships that um, are not rewarding and there's mistreatment and so forth. And, and I'm not trying to say that we shouldn't, especially in relationships of some significance, let people know if it's appropriate sort of what we wish there was you know, a little more of in the relationship, if that's okay. And maybe there's something they want from you. you know, Maybe both of you can get more of what you'd like in the relationship. I'm, I'm not speaking against any of that. But that said, very often uh, we find ourselves impatient because we want something from another person. Warmth, love, a certain kind of responsiveness, certain kind of social supply, sometimes called narcissistic supply of attunement and and uh, validation. You know, we want more of that, and I, I get that. Um, and in a time of COVID, it's understandable that there's a lot of loneliness, and loneliness, besides being a form of suffering, is a health burden. Loneliness, chronic loneliness, wears down. Um, um, our physical health and even longevity over the over the lifespan. I'm not I'm not trying to diminish the importance of that, but um, if the, all that said, one thing we can do is to tap into our deeply um, embedded and major focus of evolution in the last several million years, what's called social engagement system inside us that um, uh, draws on different networks in the nervous system and hormonal systems as well as, as, well as the nervous system um, to foster a sense of positive relationships, positive connections with others. So one way to tap into this that can help us be more patient in our relationships is to really focus and turn up the volume on the felt sense of related already. So you can see the, the common feature here in these three most recent suggestions I'm offering to focus on the, the felt sense of being safe enough already in terms of things that we find unpleasant and we're aversive about, focusing on the felt sense of being contented enough or satisfied enough already you know, to become more patient when we have to delay gratification in terms of getting things that we want. Also, with regard to feeling impatient in our relationships and wanting you know, to, to get more stuff faster in our relationship field, um, focusing on the sense of being connected already, already connected. You know, we're with, with people who are your true friends. You're already connected. You know, you know them, they know you, you are connected. You could bring them to mind and focus on the feeling of being with them in your own mind in your own imagination. Uh, obviously also you could deliberately reach out to them, but being able to self-generate inside the theater of your own emotional somatic imagination, right? In that internal theater to bring to mind someone, I'm doing it right now, that you are friends with or you care about or you love, you love them. They may not even be alive anymore. Maybe they're just a person that you still have that strong felt sense of connection with. Suddenly, ooh, you get more patient about you know, things that you feel like you're missing in, in relationships. Also, by deliberately focusing on the region of the heart, uh, there's a lot that we still don't know about the relationship between the physical heart and the um, emotions of warm-heartedness and lovingness and so forth, but it seems kind of clear, at least at a practical level. I don't think it's deeply understood yet scientifically, but we're beginning to. Um, why it is that bringing awareness to the area around the heart and having a sense maybe of the breath flowing in and out of the heart and kind of focusing on your own warm-heartedness, regardless of shortages or delays, delays, in what you're wanting to receive, that can help to address interpersonal impatience. And then the last uh, comment I'd like to make um, before I open it up to um, 
your own questions and comments here um, <clears throat> is perhaps one of the deepest ways to practice patience of all, and one that is certainly very consistent with uh, you know deep wisdom teachings in the Buddhist tradition, which we can find uh, similar versions of, you know, maybe expressed sometimes a little differently, but you know, other similar versions in other traditions. You know, it's interesting in terms of the mountain of awakening, as it were, there may be many, 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 many different routes up the mountain up that mountain. But as you approach the summit, the roots converge and people start seeming more and more like each other as they as they converge on that summit. So here's this point I'd like to make. Impatience is rooted in time. Right? We want something painful to you know, change. We we want something that we, you know, we haven't yet received to change. We want to get something, you know, in the future. Uh, basically, impatience is time bound. In the deepest sense, uh, in the I actually I'm going to read you something I, I wrote as a little note here. So think about impatience as about wanting things to happen faster, right, in time. But the heart of time is timeless. The present is always the present. It's easy to get philosophical or esoteric about this. I don't mean it that way. I mean it the way the Buddha talked about it through direct observation right into experience. As soon as we start thinking about it, we're back in time. We're back in sequential processes that take time to unfold and have a kind of continuity, sometimes a certain recursiveness that gives us a sense of their continuity in time. Okay, but direct experiencing, we, we observe, we're always in the present. Right? There's, and the present is always present. The now is always now, and thus timeless, in effect. And um, we can have repeated experiences of that. They, they might feel like flashes, where it's almost as if you're out of time, and then time resumes, and then you're out of time, and time resumes. It's not like time stops. It's just that you really feel so centered in the present. It's like you're at the leading edge of a standing wave that is your life, right? The, the water flows over the top of a boulder. Imagine the crest of that wave at any instant in time, instantaneously. This is the instantaneous derivative of the curve, <laughs> the standing wave over the boulder. So there you are, right? At any moment, instantaneously. And in that moment, um, there's a sense of change occurring in the midst of stability, of presence, of timelessness. And when we rest in that, um, things arise and pass away, but in what the Buddha called the stainless purity of mind, we're just in that purity of the present, there's no basis for impatience. It's like the present is overwhelmingly rich. There's no basis for impatience. You're just, you're out of time. You're not in time. And the more that we can kind of train in that, yeah, not getting exotic about it, but simple about it, um, the more that we can be rooted in that timeless space, then it's spaciousness. I tried to speak to it during the meditation. Spaciousness, beingness, vastness, all these kind of help us land here, rested in timelessness while time passes. I wanted to point in the direction of of that. Okay. Okay. So, <clears throat> good, good, good. Okay. 
what do you make of all this? Any comments so far? Um, oh, I appreciate the kind feedback, uh, you know, uh, coming in. I really appreciate that. Yeah, the still point. People talk about that. Uh, yeah, patience. It's really, it's a good one. <laughs> I'm still working on it. Patience. That's great. Okay. Um, yeah, people are sharing. Uh, good, great stuff. I'm just trying to see if there's a key question. Uh, so beingness. I, I use language kind of loosely. So any kind of language just points at things and you can sort of infer what is meant by that. By simply beingness, I mean beingness first distinct from doingness. And you can get a sense of that. You know, there you are doing, 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 which is distinct from. It's not better or worse. It's just distinct from qualities of being. You know, being calm, being happy, being loving, distinct from doing the dishes, right? Doing emails, doing a discussion, that. But here in particular, I mean being, beingness as this sense of the, un, the ongoingness of the, the, the standing wave of who we are. That's kind of what I mean by being this. You know, and understandably, we start to panic when we're afraid that we're not going on being. To use the phrase from Daniel Winnicott, the great British child psychiatrist, the, the, the infant, the toddler, in part through being regulated by caregivers, needs to have some security in the child's relationships of going on being, going on being. We need it. It's very primal. You know, you look at animals in the wild. They're, as soon as they fear they're not going to go on being, they, they'll, they'll panic. So focusing on going on being as a kind of beingness actually helps us calm down and be less neurotic and rattled and more able to, to be at peace. So that's beingness. That's what I meant by that. Uh, yeah, you can rest in being, absolutely. And being <clears throat> is, a, is a good frame for doing. Doing is a tough frame for being. All this might sound kind of exotic, but you, know, you can just feel the shift. I, I know it well myself. There, shift from there I am, just caught up in drivenness, I'm getting stuff done, I'm good, I'm good at getting tasks done, boom, 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 boom. It feels kind of robotic, like burm, 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 burm. And yeah, there's maybe a bit of a dopamine rush in it, but I'm not really present. And then uh, I'll wake up and I'll notice, oh wow, I've just been caught up in doing, task doing, getting through my list, boom, 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 impatiently. And then I'll go, whoa. And I'll I'll actually, what I'll do is I'll have more of a feeling in my body, my body as a whole, present, being, and I'll focus more on, hey, wait a minute, Rick, don't be a jerk, be. Be warm, be present, <laughs> be in touch with your practice. <laughs> it's like a space or a foundation, a context in which then the email, the dish, the lunch, the call can occur. And that's a key question, isn't it? What's the container? That's, what's the ground? What's the context? However you experience that or talk about that, that's, that's the key question. You know, doing can be the figure, but what's the ground in which that figure occurs? And if you already feel um, a sense of contentment in your ground, a sense of fundamental basic all rightness in your ground. And if you can feel a fundamental, you know, simple, a genuine, positive relationality, you know, like simple, you know, like a fundamental warm heartedness. If you're grounded in that, then tasks can get done patiently. <laughs> Okay, I hope this is not too something. Okay, all right, anybody, let's see. Maybe 
one person, any one person have a succinct, clear question? Anybody want to raise their hand? I'll call on you. I think I have to ask you to unmute. Uh, if you don't want to, it's really okay. We'll just take another couple minutes here. No? I'm not seeing anyone. All right. Great. No worries. So, <clears throat> Yeah, so several things. So the discussion on patients, you can uh, definitely review it because we record this and we'll post them within a couple of days. Um, so many great questions coming in right now. So I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm impatient. How do I get to the, all of them? A couple things. Um, first, it's really natural. Much like I said, it's natural to be uncomfortable, let's say, or find certain things unpleasant, like the room's too hot for your nature, or there's a heavy heartedness or sorrow in you for how long it's taking governments um, to grapple with global warming. Okay, so this is the distinction the Buddha made um, between the first dart and the second dart. I've alluded to it already many times tonight where things are unpleasant, things are bad, understandably. On the other hand, if wisdom tells us that there's only so much we can do ourselves, we're doing what we can do ourselves, there's no value add in getting agitated about it or hostile toward other people about it or self-critical about it, um, you know, that's where we disengage from the second darts we throw ourselves. And this is the province of patience. Patience is like an inter internal shock absorber that enables us to avoid all those forms of agitation. And so both can occur side by side. Um, I'm outraged. I'm a pretty mellow guy. I cannot begin to tell you. I. I I'm just outraged. I'm stunned. I'm appalled. Um, I'm deeply angry at what so many people are deliberately doing to perpetuate, um, you know, basically carbonized industries and just wrecking so many things for life today. It's already happening and it's just going to get worse for our children and their children. All right. Okay. By the way, I better finish up. I'm not going to be able to respond to questions. Maybe next time I'll try to open it up for people. In fact, I'll do that deliberately. Although, no, next week we're going to have a guest teacher. I'll be back two weeks later. But my point is, we can feel these things while being patient with our own reactions. Someone brought up, can you be patient with yourselves? You know, we can be patient with our own reactions. We can have a sense of spaciousness, enduringness. One of the metaphors that's used a lot in Buddhism for this is to be the ground, the earth. Like the earth accepts, it receives so many things, and the earth continues to abide, right? And um, yeah. So to finish up here, I just want to emphasize the feeling of patience, right? What's it feel like when you're rested in a kind of peacefulness and patience, like you can endure. You're not invaded in your core. You're okay. You're okay. All right? What's that feel like? The basic feeling of that, knowing what that's like. And as you deepen in your insight, your vipassana, your insight through practice, insight into emptiness, insight into the eternal present. What's it feel like more and more to just feel rested in this stillness around which motion is happening? The feeling of that, that's what really matters most. That's how we deepen in our practice, deepen in the sense of this. Right. Like Siddhartha, you know, we can think and we can wait. I'm still working on fasting. 
as a fairly skinny guy, it's not always good for me. Okay, so let's wait with each other for a minute here. Before, for those who want, if you stick around a few minutes later, uh, Tom Brown, my co-pilot, will sort you into breakout rooms in Zoom. You don't have to do that. Usually around 80 or 100 people or so stick around for that part. Um, but how about for a minute, we just sit quietly with each other, patiently. Maybe you need to move on to something else, but if you could just wait and to feel okay enough in the present to simply abide patiently, not needing things to change and get better or more interesting. in the present as it is, patiently. Realizing too that much as you have your own schedule and timetable, your own pace, your own rate, of getting things done. Other people have their pace, schedule, priorities. That's not always your own. Being more spacious for them. Less friction. More space. Thank you very much.